Good morning to all of you. Uh, whenever I teach a class, I, uh, the first day of classes, I talk about my name, which is a very odd and confusing name, is Teofilo. My name is Teofilo Ruiz, and uh, I explain to the students that my name is a Greek name, though I am Cuban, not Greek, and that it means love of God, Zeus Philus, but that they could, should call me Teo, which means God, and you are most welcome to do the same. I should also add uh, out of my script here that I was an ACLS fellow, a great honor to have been an ACLS fellow in 1979, which is long before some of the panelists were born. And if I were to compete with these young people today, I would have been last. And I know that, and it's not a, an act of modesty because I have also been a reader for ACLS applications and I have written to Nicole and I say, this is amazing. The quality of these applications is extraordinary. I am glad that I am the age I am because if I were in this market, I will be last. I will never get a fellowship. Now, as this is the first formal session today, it is my privilege to welcome you to the 94th annual meeting of the American Council of Learned Societies. The first part of the ACLS mission is the, quote, advancement of humanistic studies in all fields of the humanities and social sciences. We strive to do this in many ways, but one of the chief means is by awarding research fellowships through a rigorous process of peer review. The ACLS annual meeting is one of the few venues where scholars from the full range of the humanities and interpretive social sciences can share perspectives. The ACLS fellowship programs are similarly one of the very few national institutions identifying and supporting a scholarly excellence across the range of those fields. Several years ago, the ACLS board of directors suggested that we bring the two roles together by convening at each annual meeting a panel of recent fellows. ACLS offers a number of distinct fellowship programs, but this year all the fellows on the panel hold awards made through our central fellowship program, the only one of our programs supported by an endowment. That endowment has been built up over the years with donations from foundations, colleges and universities, the National Endowment for the Humanities, which by the way was founded with the help and support of ACLS, and many individual donors who have responded each year to Pauline Yu's appeal for investment in the future of humanities scholarship, a future we can glimpse this morning with the help of these colleagues. So this is a call for you to send money. <laughs> Much money. You have in your agenda materials biographies of each fellow who will be speaking, so I can forego long introductions. We have asked each to speak briefly about their research and especially about how they situate the project in relation to currents in the fields and their own intellectual ambitions. I will read the name of the, I make a small references to the three speakers now and they will speak successively as listed in the program. The first speaker is Ruha Benjamin, uh, who is an assistant professor of sociology and African-American studies at Boston University and the author of People, Science, Bodies, and Rights in the Stem, in the stem Cell Frontier, Stanford University Press, 2013. And she, of course, went to Berkeley, spent some time at UCLA, so she's almost a relative. The second speaker is Sarah H. Jacobi, is an assistant professor in the Department of Religious Studies at Northwestern University. She studies South Asian religions with a specialization in Tibetan Buddhism. She received a BA from Yale University, a MA and PhD degree from the University of Virginia Department of Religious Studies. She teaches now at Northwestern in 2009 after completing a postdoctoral fellowship at the Society of Fellows in the Humanities at Columbia University. Uh, she has many publications, include a book she co-edited with Antonio Terron entitled Buddhism Beyond the Monastery, 
tantric practices in the performances in Tibet and the Himalayas, and another book co-author. Our third speaker is Adrian Jones. He is uh, Alan Grant McLean Professor of History at the University of Chicago. Uh, he was educated at Cambridge, had uh, stints as a professor at the University of San Diego, at Cal State, and left Paradisical California to go to Chicago. He's the author of uh, many books. Uh, one of them is The Nature of the Book, uh, uh, which is a significant and important contribution to the history of the book. And now uh, he uh, is writing a long history of conflict, The Death of a Pirate, 2011. So uh, we will begin with Ruha Benjamin. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for including me on the fellows panel. So as instructed, I'm supposed to sort of situate my work um, both within intellectual currents in my, in my subfields and also just sort of tell you a little bit about how I came to the project that I worked, am working on this year. Um, so many of us can point to a book or a course or a professor that's played a large part in setting us on our intellectual path. For me, that course was the sociology of knowledge and science in the spring of 2002, taught by Professor Troy Dester at UC Berkeley. And when I look back, I think this subfield gripped my interest because it seemed to focus on a somewhat taboo area of study as it questions the universality and autonomy of science, that is, modernity's religion, which seemed to be positioned as somehow above and beyond critical inquiry. So locating, that is provincializing science in time and place, is both an epistemic and a normative challenge for me because I'm not only interested in the social underpinnings of science, but also the social omissions, those interests and values that are excluded from one of modernity's central projects. My first book, which was mentioned, um, locates US-based stem cell research at the nexus of market-based market uh, medicine, biological citizenship claims, and histories of scientific experimentation on marginalized populations. And my current ACLS-sponsored project widens this lens to include genomic science in a global context. Here again, I'm interested in examining what's essentially a science that is, seeks to understand the origins and implications of human difference. And I investigate how folk taxonomies like race and caste in different countries shape the work of genomicists and vice versa, how genomic findings are used by non-scientists to advance political claims of belonging and redress. So in the time remaining, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the interventions this work is engaged in um, within some wider intellectual currents, what I've dubbed for short binaries, business as usual, and boogeymen. And as I run through these, I'll try to integrate a few of my initial findings and give you some sense of how the conceptual rubber hits the empirical road, so to speak. So the first trend, binaries grows out of a consensus among social scientists that solidified following World War II and the Nazi atrocities, that race is a social and political fabrication, albeit one with real, often deadly consequences. And it's best expressed in the 1950 UNESCO statement on race, which declared that for all practical purposes, race is not so much a biological phenomenon as a social myth. This binary between things dubbed natural and things understood as social does a lot of work, epistemic and otherwise, because the idea that what's on the right side of the screen is a complex, constructed, dynamic social reality is predicated on an unspoken exclusion or yielding of an imagined, inherent, stable, natural side of human existence found on your left side. So that too often the way that we humanists and social scientists engage with the life sciences, especially around issues of race and gender, is to assert the primacy of the social and the bankruptcy of the natural in order to win authority over the study of race, for example. 
But in so doing, we unintentionally reinscribe rather than dismantle this basic division, social versus natural, which is at the heart of so many of our modern binaries, civilized versus primitive, white versus black, man versus woman, cosmopolitan versus provincial. The second half of each of these binaries is bound to the natural world, even if romantically so, just as the first half suffers the complexities of the social world. And so related to this, when we begin to think about genetics in particular, the language we use to describe nature plays a critical role in what we end up seeing and not seeing in our, in our analyses. So recently there's been some great work on how metaphors in and about science serve as heuristics that help us see and not see particular aspects of the worlds we investigate. DNA as a map, a blueprint, a holy grail, and a book of life, all of which have been critiqued in one way or another for viewing biology in overly deterministic reductionist ways, as if everything can be boiled down to the ACGT alphabet, the tyranny of heritability, as it were. An alternative set of metaphors have come on the scene to account for the role of interactions, regulation, and environmental factors in gene expression, networks, recipes, genes as servants of proteins, and even more poetically, comparing genetic improvisation to a jazz orchestra. One really provocative academic editorial I came across recently set itself up as seeking a lingua democratica rather than a lingua franca of, on debate on genomics, saying that metaphors can serve as a prophylactic against reification, arguing also for the need to, quote, counteract the privileged position of scientists whose metaphoric descriptions tend to hide the implicit values embedded in their work. But the way that the nature-nurture binary gets institutionalized across disciplines means that many humanists and social scientists tend to disengage from those aspects of the social world deemed natural, yielding to the hard sciences in a way I don't see us doing with political, economic, and historical modes of knowledge production. And this should be of particular concern to us now because of the way that bodies and environments are becoming ever more politicized and commoditized behind a veneer of positivist inevitability. So a few quick examples before moving on to the second intervention. This is an image from the website of a company called DNA Tribes, one of many genetic ancestry testing companies engaged in a kind of re-territorialization of human difference. They say that, quote, this is the company, instead of relying on socially constructed racial or ethnic divisions, implying these are of lesser reliability, DNA tribes defines world regions using objective mathematical criteria. So a proprietary statistical method is applied to over 950 individual population samples around the world to identify groups of populations with shared genetic characteristics. So note here the distinction being made. These tribes are statistically not socially constructed, as if statistics were not a form of social practice. The provincialization of science, as I'm calling it, is taking place as much in the public sphere by national governments as it is by the private sector. So here's a second example. In some of the first population genomic findings in Mexico, scientists confirm what they say we already know about group boundaries. There, as in much of Latin America, diversity mapping rests upon the cultural scaffolding of mestizaje, as this article's findings suggest, with government-sponsored researchers attempting to confirm the biological underpinnings of commonly held ideas of mixture. No longer beholden to pure racial types, the Mexican genome is said to be a heterogeneous European, indigenous, and African admixture, more indigenous in the south, more African on the coast, and more white in the northern regions, as shown in this newspaper report. Likewise, in India, caste divisions have become a major locus of genomic investigation. This Nature article reports, quote, some historians have argued that caste in modern India is an invention of colonialism. However, our results indicate that many current distinctions among groups are ancient, and that strong endogamy must have shaped marriage patterns in India for thousands of years. 
Among the key findings of this study, it's this reinscription of continental racial categories that routinely gets taken up in popular discourse, as with this Times of India headline, upper caste India male, more European, says study which resonates in interesting ways with the Mexican headline in, both, in that both seem more concerned with which subgroups are more European. And here I want to say a quick word about how mapping and marketing populations relate to, to one another. So in the, my second intervention, business as usual, fixing race as a stable set of categories is justified in terms of fixing, that is treating, racial health disparities with pharmaceutical interventions. Goodwill aside, it's important to note that the global pharmaceutical industry has recently faced a major crisis in that an estimated $140 billion worth of drugs lost their patents between 2006 and 2010. Thus, companies are under pressure to reconfigure their business models and find new markets as blockbuster drugs fall over the, quote, patent cliff. And so the one-size-fits-all model of drug development is giving way to a niche marketing strategy in which resuscitating the value of intellectual property is leading companies to turn to, quote, growth potential in specialty markets and in emerging nations, which in part is being justified through the resuscitation of racialized understandings of biological difference as the value added. So it's this anxiety-ridden context that researchers in a growing number of so-called emerging economies are successfully lobbying their governments to exercise a kind of protective ownership or sovereignty over the DNA of their populations. As one US-based investor recently lamented, the expansion of big pharma into foreign markets has, quote, hit a roadblock, nationalism. So this protectionist science policy frame, genomic sovereignty, implicitly brands national populations as biologically distinct from other populations, naturalizing nation-state boundaries to ensure that less developed countries receive the economic and medical benefits that may result from genomics. And as with this strategic use of diversity in marketing other kinds of products, attention to genomic difference is easily construed as a social good which leads to the third and final intervention, um, which for today I've, I've dubbed boogeyman. And this has to do with discerning the continuities and discontinuities between genomics and older forms of racial science. Genomicists themselves are quick to point out that this is not your grandfather's race science with all its attendant eugenic and coercive discontents. And I would tend to agree, this is not simply a case of old wine and new bottles, but a case of new wine about which very old origins are being attributed. The tools of bioinformatics, in other words, are being used to create compelling stories about genealogy, migration, and kinship that vary depending on the other social narratives with which scientists are in conversation. To ignore the provincialization of genomics in particular time and place and chalk this all up to the resurrection of old racial science overlooks how it's being used and interpreted by a range of social actors, not simply scientists. As expressed by one prominent Mexican official, we believe that if we do not carry out studies to understand our genomic patrimony well, no one will because they'll be interested in their own populations. Secondly, should the interest exist and they come to get this information, they make us dependent on it, and then it'll cost us. We have to develop our own genomic information. And whereas Mexico is one of the first places to actually codify genomic sovereignty in their constitution, its conceptual underpinnings are emerging elsewhere. This past February, I was visiting Johannesburg and spoke with South Africa's most prominent human geneticist. Summing up her tireless efforts to map population diversity and make it relevant to public health in the country, she explained that what drives her is that South Africans, quote, deserve to know the true story of Africa so they can feel pride again. And genomic analysis, she feels, can offer that. Again, genomics is a kind of post-colonial truth-telling, a statistically mediated collective memory. She encouraged me to visit a new museum called the Origin Center, shown here on the Witz campus, where visitors are invited to provide saliva samples and pay to get genotyped, with the option to have your results publicly displayed alongside that of Nelson Mandela <laughs> to find out if you're related. 
This is one of a growing number of localized nation building projects in South Africa and elsewhere that enrolls non-scientists in a hybrid scientific social enterprise, which is not only about imagining but materializing a national community that in this case seeks to be distinctly post-apartheid. So as a social scientist, my aim isn't to simply accept the story of genomics, that it can somehow adjudicate the truth of South African peoplehood, nor is my goal to set out to debunk that story as mere statistical fabrication, but rather to trace how both nature and culture, science and sovereignty, get constituted in the social practices of both scientists and non-scientists. With that, here are a few mementos from the field where I began visiting genome institutes, conducting interviews, and producing a mixed archive of documents and media that relate to this project. And I owe a huge thanks to the ACLS community for seeing promise in my work and funding my sabbatical year at the Kennedy School. Thank you. Thank you. It's really a wonderful honor um, to be here and to have a chance to thank ACLS in person and to share my research with you all. Um, it, uh, having an ACLS fellowship this year has truly meant the difference between finishing and not finishing my book manuscript, and for that, I'm really very grateful. Um, my current project is a study of an early 20th century Tibetan visionary who's one of the few women in Tibetan literary history to write an autobiography about her life. Um, my study examines the literary devices with which she wrote as well as the social world she depicted through her autobiographical writings. Um, and so, Today, what I want to focus on, rather than the intricacies of Tibetan religious history, because something tells me I might be a little bit more fascinated by all that um, uh, than maybe some others, um, is uh, the meta level of so what? Why do these kinds of studies, and what's the point in the larger humanities field? Um, and I also want to uh, let you know you can read more about the details if you so wish. My book has just been accepted by Columbia University Press. It should come out sometime in 2014, tentatively titled Love and Liberation in the Autobiographical Writings of the Tibetan Visionary Sarah Kondro. Um, so on to this question, so what? This is a big question. We can answer this in lots of different ways. Um, for me, what comes up is what's sometimes called the narrative identity thesis, the idea to borrow all, Oliver Sacks' terms, each of us constructs and lives a narrative, and that this narrative is us, our identities. Um, to borrow Jerome Bruner's wording, narrative, rather than referring to reality, may in fact create or constitute it. So the idea is that the stories we tell about ourselves and our actual experience are intermingled. One doesn't come before the other. The point, um, we can only imagine a world based on the stories we've been told by our relatives on TV and literature, film, and so on. If we don't have a rich grasp of stories out of which to weave the narrative of our lives, wherever those yarns lead us, we see only a small fraction of the world. Um, so to talk about what this has meant to me personally and how the project that I'm working on now originally came into being, um, I would go back to a junior semester abroad program I did as an undergraduate, which brought me to India, Nepal, and Tibet, and in so doing changed the course of what I would work on in my life. And this is a circumambulation route around Tibet's most sacred mountain, Mount Kailash, in the western region. And I remember photographing these uh, nomads who are also on pilgrimage and wondering, what is their life like? What are they doing? And wanting to talk to them, but having no common language. There's no cognate between Tibetan and English, no ability to communicate. Um, also, as an undergraduate, I met um, an old man who is one of the oldest living members of the Tibetan Buddhist religious tradition. And I was fascinated by him, and I returned for, for several years after that as a graduate student. Um, I mentioned the funding because I was at the area studies conversation last night, so I was only able to actually learn Tibetan because of the foreign language and area studies funding that I received. Um, 
and also a Fulbright-Hayes uh, later on doctoral dissertation research grant, which allowed me to learn the Eastern Tibetan dialect that this man speaks and to realize that he was holding, literally in this photograph, um, a handwritten manuscript written by his teacher, one of the very few women in Tibetan history to write an autobiography. So over um, the years of getting to know him, I was able to have a copy of this manuscript and to work on it and bring it out into the larger community. So it's been a, a fortuitous connection. Um, to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, the, uh, that mountain is in Western Tibet right here, Mount Kailash. Sarah Kondro, about whom I'm, I'm writing, was born in 1892 in Lhasa. Um, I did a FLAS grant, a Foreign Language and Area Studies grant here, studying Tibetan for a year, which set me up to follow in her footsteps. She traveled eastward um, towards a nomadic territory called Golok. This is in the, now the southeastern portion of Qinghai province. Um, and the Foreign Language, uh, sorry, the uh, Fulbright Hayes was to study this region. So um, in, t in Sarah Kondro's day in the early 20th century, Golok was an unincorporated territory, meaning it neither paid tribute to the Dalai Lama's government based in Lhasa, nor um, governments to the east, the Qing Dynasty, or later the Republic of China. One reason that it was able to maintain its autonomy for a very long time until it was incorporated into the PRC in 1954 is because of the inhospitable climate that um, People experienced very high altitude above the tree line, no uh, agriculture, and um, it's a nomadic pastoral um, climate. Um, it would have been, it would have looked somewhat like this in the early 20th century when Sarah Kondo lived, although the solar panel right here would clearly not have been there. After all, the nomads need to plug in their cell phones to recharge them somewhere, right? Um, so my experience of living in these communities has helped me to provincialize Europe, to use the same term actually that Ruha introduced in another context. Um, I'm borrowing, of course, Chakrabarti's book title to say that, but in other words, to gain a sense of perspective from which I could view contemporary Euro-American forms of modernity, secularity, and constructions of the self as one possibility among a constellation of others. And this is something that I hope that readers of my book will also get a, an experience of. Um, so tying this into the broader context of my academic work, um, I think of the earlier scholarship in autobiography theory, such as this foundational um, figure, Georges Gustorf, who wrote about, and I, I have the uh, image here of a horse with blinders, because this is what I think of us like this. Um, the idea that autobiography is not to be found outside of our cultural area. It is a concern peculiar to Western man. It's something that we've communicated to the men of other cultures. So. Um, as more work on autobiography has come out, of course this is being disproved time and time again. Um, the context of Tibetan literature is but one example among that larger trend. Um, Tibetans have been writing biography and autobiography since the 11th century to the present day. There are thousands of manuscripts that have yet to be studied. And out of those thousands, less than 1% is written by or about Tibetan women. So it's been particularly fortuitous to find one of those and have a chance to bring it to light. Um, so also, in terms of the history of sentiment, we find a specifically Euro-American focus on just tomes of research on the genealogy of love. Just to give a brief example, the philosopher Robert Solomon writes that we should expect to find the origins or at least the intensification of romantic love in the rise of the individual in the West. The idea generally goes that the 12th century, the rise of courtly love um, in uh, contradistinction to the asceticism of the church led to particular um, concepts of sentiment, which then um, with the romantic tradition uh, metamorphosized into the romantic love that we experience as part of life stories today. Um, Anthony Giddens and Charles Taylor have also uh, worked extensively on this, as have others. Um, it's often linked to the 18th century, to the rise of the novel, to industrialization, to capitalism, and so forth. There's nothing wrong with this, but my point is that before we can say um, that there's a certain construction of sentiment, or in William Reddy's words, an opposition between desire and 
um, true love and that this is unique to Western conceptions and practices, we would need to know a great deal about the rest of the world in order to claim this kind of uniqueness. So um, what I think is necessary is sustained attention to examining alternative genealogies of love based on historical, literary, and ethnographic research. Um, this work is, is starting to be done. There's some great work on the cult of sentiment in China. A recent book on love in Africa came out a few years ago. And I see my work on the um, depiction of love in Tibetan literature to contribute to this larger effort. Um, so to give you a sense of how I came to this topic, one of the things that struck me in, in reading Sarah Condro's autobiography is the great deal of um, sentimental attachment and love that she depicts between herself and her teacher, um, Drimeosar. I've put the name there because Tibetan names are notoriously difficult to actually pronounce. Um, Sarah Condro wrote more than 600 pages of autobiographical material. The first work was a biography of her teacher. The second work was an autobiography of herself. So there are two biographies, and they interconnect with each other. Um, and unlike our romantic tradition, she has fit uh, her depiction of sentiment into her own Tibetan Buddhist tradition, modeling herself and Drimyosar, their relationship on the tantric Buddhist vision of complete Buddhahood. The iconography for this, in her words, um, is the tantric wrathful deities, Hayagriva and Vradravrahi, in union. The philosophical insight behind this is the idea that Buddhahood is the union of two gendered principles insight and skillful means. And you can think as I'm talking about which one is female and which one is male. Maybe we can have a little contest. So insight refers to the realization of emptiness, the idea that um, we uh, are empty of a separate and permanent selfhood. So it's an assertion on a philosophical level of a radical interdependence and interconnectedness um, between uh, selves and others and the natural environment. And this is paired with skillful means, which is often defined as compassion, a benevolent action in the world towards others. So to perfect this um, leads to complete Buddhahood. Sarah Kondro effectively carved a place for herself in a male-oriented Tibetan religious world by aligning herself with the insight that formed an essential complement to compassion. So I've kind of let you know the answer there. Ultimately, she realized these qualities not only through alliance with her guru, but inside herself. So if this sounds pretty esoteric, um, I think the breakdown of the self-other divide that comes through so clearly in Sarah Kondro's writing um, which I write about as a kind of depiction of a relational selfhood has other ramifications um, for those of us reading it. For example, um, contemplating the interdependent nature of the self, it, it first of all has Buddhist doctrinal origins, but beyond that, um, it can remind us that compassion for others is integral to gratifying our own self-interest or on a global level that promoting international peace is integral to guarding national security. Um, so I'd like to close with an image of the Tibetan sky because the horizon is so vast it's impossible to capture in a photograph. Um, we can all use an introduction to and a reminder of the fact that there are many different stories through which people shape their lives. This broadening of horizons is one among the many valuable contributions that humanities education can provide our students and that funding from learned societies such as the ACLS makes possible. The value of a humanistic education is different in kind than the dollars and cents invested into it or the earning potential garnered from it. Education in the humanities can provide more space for creativity, ingenuity, and imagination that is both lucrative and liberating in many senses of the word. Thank you. So, um, comrades, um, <laughs> I uh, have been spending a long time, longer than anybody should on any particular project, um, worrying about 
the historical constitution of what you might loosely call the information society or the information age. Um, this goes back beyond the, the current work that's been very generously funded by the ACLS to the 1990s, even, even the 1980s, uh, when I started out as an early modernist historian working on roughly the 16th and 17th centuries in Western Europe. Um, and uh, at that point, what I was interested in, am I just, am I just leaning on this? <laughs> I have uh, something to learn about the, the, the uh, <laughs> things about these, these uh, information technologies. Wow. Techno. <laughs> yeah, it looks, uh, like, uh, looks like everybody's so, going to so, sleep on yes, all those I know. years. But <laughs> let's just get, bring this all the way down. I thought this was on purposely. Well, no, it's, you know, we never, never a truer word. But, um, this should go to sleep. There you go. There. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> um, so, anyway, um, I kind of feel like I ought to sit down now after that. Um, so, I've been working on, on loosely the historical constitution of the information age. Um, in, in various respects. So back in the 80s and 90s, I did work on the 16th and 17th century and how it was that, if you want to call it this, print culture was created by the hard work of lots and lots of disparate, disparate kinds of people. So um, printers, booksellers, writers, scholars, readers. And it wasn't something that just emerged from the character of the printing press itself. It was something that had to be made. Um, since then, I've come to focus on issues of what we now call intellectual property, um, which is clearly a big issue today. I mean, you know, we, we, all of us, anybody who makes or circulates or uses information has some stake in the game of intellectual property. Um, and that basically means all of us, because these days, pretty much everything that's a part of the economy has an informational character. Anything that has any kind of design whatsoever has an informational intellectual property character. So all of us um, have some kind of stake in the debates about intellectual property that take place. Um, intellectual property is not that old a concept, though. Uh, it actually originates in the mid-19th century, and it wasn't a, a, a kind of recognized customary term until quite late in the 19th century. You couldn't be something like an intellectual property lawyer until maybe the 1870s or 1880s. Um, there's a much longer history, interestingly, of the violation of intellectual property. This is bizarre that, that piracy actually was, was uh, identified as a sin and an offence in the 17th century. So that raises a question of if you can have an offence, what is an offence against if you don't have the concept that we now think it's an offence against? So the, the second book that I wrote was called Piracy and was an attempt to excavate the, the excavate that question, and by doing that, to see something of the long, deep roots of the passionate debates that, that divide our world of information today. Um, so, what, so, in a sense, one of my central points that I want to just state, and it's given that this session is about directions in humanistic uh, research, is to say that one of the reasons why I think humanistic research, for me, matters, is that um, I have a conviction which is rather like Bruno Latour's, that we have never been modern. But in my case, the reason why I think we've never been modern is that we've never stopped being early modern. Um, you know, we still are inheritors of and act as in the, the, the game that was set up in the early modern period by those people who invented uh, print culture and piracy and copyright and all of those things. Um, so in the last year, um, I've been starting out on what's going to be, I'm afraid, another long project, which has to do with an industry that's arisen really in the last 20 years. Um, this industry is one that I've come to call the, inter the intellectual property defense industry. Um, it's, it has deep roots, and one of the, the points of this project is to show those deep roots, so to go back into the Middle Ages and look at how things like authorship were upheld, protected, defended through, through the, that long period. But in its late modern form, it's a distinct invention of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and 2000s. Um, a, a sign of that is that um, big international conferences now take place. The first of these took place in about 2000, 2002. Um, they now take place about twice a year that bring together from all over the world 
police, public agencies, private corporations like Microsoft and Adobe, big pharmaceutical companies, to talk about the practical strategies by which information is uh, protected, is rendered authentic in the, in the networked world in which we all live. Um, the, 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 these conferences um, render coherent an enterprise of anti-counterfeiting and anti-piracy. Um, an enterprise that might not otherwise have been, have been deemed to be coherent because the domains in which it operates are actually pretty much distinct. There's not a lot, actually, that links the world of, of say, pharmaceuticals with that of computer games. Um, but in these big conferences, they, that, that is uh, construed and constructed as a single domain. Um, so, so I've been investigating, or starting to investigate, these, the, this, this industry. Um, it's interesting for various reasons, um, but I think, again, to get to the, the central topic of the, the day, um, I think that the reason why a humanistic kind of historian like me should be interested in it is that, it, is that investigating it gets us to something foundational. Um, it gets us to the mundane practices and not just the high theory or the, the government policies or the laws through which the way that we live is, is constituted. Um, every time that we pick up a book, every time we listen to a piece of music, every time we take a medicine, we are reliant on, or at least this is the way the industry sees itself, we are reliant on the steps that are taken invisibly by this industry. Um, when we have big public debates about intellectual property and information policy, as in the United States last year with SOPA and PIPA, as with the um, Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, ACTA, um, as, as now with the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, um, there is a real sense in which those debates, important and passionate as they are, miss the point. Because, because they miss the, the central issue, which is that those kinds of laws, those kinds of, of measures, legislative agendas and so forth, come into being when uh, enforcement practices and detection practices that are already in place in the world come a cropper for some reason. Um, so in the case of SOPA and PIPA, the measures that were going to be legalized by those measures were, were actions that, are, were, that were already customary in the intellectual property defense industry, and they've been running up against opposition from public interest groups and, and the courts. There's a, there's a history to that pattern, that the defense of authorship and intellectual property um, overreaches, that it comes up against public and political opposition, and at that point, it goes into the domain of, of legislation and, and becomes very public. But, but what, what we need to know as a society is the development of these strategies at ground level before they, they break surface in these big public debates. Um, that's something that... Uh, humanistic social scientific inquiry can reveal to us, and it's something that I think is of major um, cultural consequence. Um, and it's a major cultural consequence, uh, ironically, not because the issue is dramatically new. Uh, this is again something that I think a, a historicist kind of take can really make clear. Um, we tend to assume, almost as a starting point, that the issues are that are raised by, say, the internet or genomics are radically new because the technology is radically new, and it is radically new. But the issues not, are not necessarily so new. And in fact, I think that the issues that are raised by the defense of intellectual property, things like DRM and so forth, um, are some of the deepest, oldest, most traditional issues of, uh, of political order. So in particular, one would go back to the issue that's raised by Cicero at the beginnings of, of Western politics, um, namely who guards the guards. Um, the, the, one of the major contributions that I think a humanistic inquiry into this industry can, can uh, illuminate is that we have here a global public-private hybrid policing and surveillance industry that operates in its eyes for the public good and in some way, and is, is for the public good. I mean, that, that's something that should be taken seriously. And, and yet it's, it's invisible pretty much to the public and the level of accountability that it has institutionally is zero. Um, so uh, that's one thing that I just wanted to raise. I also want to raise a different, uh, uh, I want to just mention to you a different kind of project that similarly has to do with foundational questions uh, to human culture. 
that is not actually part of the ACLS thing that I've been doing, but I think it's worth mentioning here, which is the bid to have a history of scientific reading. Um, here, what I'm interested in is the, what seems to be a, a convergence that's happening at the moment between um, ideas of reading that, that are produced out of the sciences and ideas of reading that, that are produced out of the humanities. So in the sciences, there are now two uh, strands of research into the act of reading, one of which is loosely neurological and has to do with imaging of, of individual brains, and the other of which is algorithmic and has to do with the elimination <laughs> of brains and their replacement by algorithms, by mechanisms, as in machine reading. Um, Machine reading already happens. It's done by the pharmaceutical industry. Um, it depend I didn't go to the session last night on open access, but it's an interesting factoid that machine reading in pharmaceutical research, to the extent that it's a scientific revolution, as its boosters claim that it is, depends on the open access uh, movement in, in the sciences, because it's only with open access that the, the algorithms can freely range across millions of research papers in order to produce the, the, the trial hypotheses that they do. Um, and what, of course, happens in the sciences happens in the humanities too. It is an interesting and little noticed fact that in the whole Google Books furore over the last decade, when, when, the, when Google and the publishers launched their draft agreement about five years ago, the one that was eventually turned back by the judge, a central part of that was that you could opt out of the display of large amounts of your book right, for human readers. You could not opt out of machine reading. Um, and that, to me, was something of a giveaway, that maybe for Google what this is all about is actually not, <clears throat> not human readers at all. Human readers are kind of a nice add-on. Um, it's actually about uh, machine reading, the replacement of human readers by, by algorithms. Um, the, the point about both machine reading and um, neuroscientific accounts of reading is that they both deny and insist upon certain kinds of history. So in the case of, of neuroscience, the ins insistence is that reading is essentially an individualist act. It has to do with uh, brain structures that are to all intents and purposes fixed because they work on evolutionary timescales, which are so much bigger than human history. Um, and the, the history of culture is essentially an, an adaptation or a series of more or less successful adaptations to that brain structure. In other words, the entire history of, of cultural diversity, and this is put explicitly by some of the backers of this project, is, uh, is illusory. Um, and the historian of reading should have nothing to say. In the case of machine reading, the virtue of, the, of uh, applying machines to vast amounts of data is not just that it can read much more than, we, than any human can. It's that humans are constrained by their disciplinary expertise. So we are products of the 19th century disciplinary frameworks that were set up with the formation of the universities. Any human expert is therefore going to be an expert in some one thing, genomics, whatever it is, and will not be able to see correlations across the disciplinary structure of journals, whereas machine readers are not, in theory, subject to that disciplinary legacy and can see correlations that we can't. In other words, machine reading's virtue rests on, at the same time as it denies, a kind of, uh, a kind of historicity. So there ought to be a, something that humanistic historians should be able to say to both of these movements. And I think that it, it behooves us to say something to them and to say something constructive, not just neuroscience is reductionist or, or machine reading is, is you know, simplistic or that kind of thing. Sometimes they are reductionist, sometimes they are simplistic, but not always. Um, and I think that what we can say about it is that the character of these scientific enterprises themselves has arisen through processes in the history of reading by, by humans, and not just by individual humans, but by human communities. Um, it's often the case that the way in which scientific communities come together is, is through the delegation and collectivization of reading practices. This continues to be the case now. That, I mean, labs often only come together as laboratories every week or so when they have paper groups, journal groups, when somebody will present a delegated reading of a journal article and the lab will come together into a room to, to discuss it. That's often the only time when a research group will actually be constituted as a research group. Um, and there's a long history to these practices of delegation and collectivization of reading. Um, the other thing is that the, in the sciences, as, as in the humanities, reading is a recursive thing as well as being delegated and collectivized. Uh, we tend to think of authorship as the moment of creativity. Authorship produces books and papers which are then read that's the time's arrow, but it's not like that very often. 
um, readings circulate back into authorship, even in the same books that are read. So there's a great case in the form of um, James Clerk Maxwell's Treatise on Electricity and Magnetism, which is one of the, the foundational books of modern physics, when the, the version of that book that we now have is largely built out of the misreadings of Cambridge students, it turns out, that were then critically kind of appended into the first edition, which is actually very different from the one that we think is now the book. And that's quite normal, actually, for the history of books. So the point is that what we now know, where we as disciplinary communities, including software engineers, depends on the emergence and sustaining of these reading communities in the past and in the present. You don't escape from that kind of discipline by creating a new piece of software that emerges out of your culture. Um, on the other hand, though, it's also not the case that uh, making that piece of software is simply a kind of de de deterministic extension of the community of reading that exists and has existed historically. Um, there is something new going on here. And the new is double-edged, as it always is. I have a colleague at uh, Chicago in, called James Evans in sociology who's done massive data set research showing that um, in the case of machine reading, just as our scope of inquiry, the, the amount of data we can appeal to, increases massively with the online databases. So, we so these, these devices, because they're recursive, they, they uh, incorporate into themselves the results of previous searches, narrow down much more quickly into a few conventional kinds of suggestions and answers. So we have the paradoxical situation that just as in principle, we massively increase the range of possibility. In practice, because of our reliance on what are actually, despite their claims, disciplinary uh, systems, we, what, we're, what we're actually doing is uh, prematurely narrowing the range of imagination. Um, and the range of imagination is something that is the preserve <laughs> I mean, of, of, uh, of humanists, it seems to me. Um, by, by arriving at well-informed, constructively critical historical takes on these kinds of um, enterprises. We can help to shape the, the, the future, I think, of knowledge and culture themselves, and to do so in a way that they help to uh, continue to serve the public good. Um. Uh. You see now why I would have been last in this uh, competition. Uh, I feel like Miranda at the side of Ferdinand, oh brave new world that has such people in it. But I would like to make a little point before we open the floor for questions, which is that as Sarah mentioned, she went to Tibet with a Fulbright haze, which no longer exists. She learned Tibetan with a flask, which have been violently and awfully cut down. And so it behooves all the learned societies and. In fact, the work that the ACLS does in supporting a young cohort of scholars who would have been lost otherwise to this generation. And I think that it is incumbent in all of us to stand up to the incredible attacks on the humanities and the social sciences, not only here, but throughout the Western world. And it is the labor that ACLS does and all the learned societies that prevents a total catastrophe in our loss. So, the floor is open for these very stimulating papers. So, I will shut up, and you are, and by the way, it's the first time that I wear a tie to any of these things. <laughs> um, so please, questions. By the way, we have the lights in our eyes, so it's very difficult for me to see who is raising his or her hands. Charlotte Koo, American Council of Learned Societies, and delegate from the American Economic Association, which is um, reductionist in its own way. Uh, now, I, I have a question for uh, Professor Johns and Professor Benjamin, which is you are really understanding science from, or, or practices in science from a humanistic point of view. The question is, how do you get scientists who come from this reductionist background to listen to you? One of the interesting sort of developments, perhaps uh, the success of humanistic training, social scientific training, 
for the generation of scientists that myself and a few other colleagues are studying in, the, in genomics and stem cell research is that these are people who had to take the mandatory social science or the mandatory humanities course or courses as part of their early training. And so the ideas that we're talking about are, are not outside of their range of understanding. In fact, um, many times they're thinking and doing their work with the kind of sensibilities we're talking about. So uh, a colleague of mine has written about the genomic fight for social justice, right, is the sub uh, subtitle of her book um, on race decoded. And what she finds when she interviews the top genomicists both in the US and Europe is that they're thinking about their work very explicitly in terms of this sort of humanistic sensibility that what they're doing is gonna treat health disparities and gonna show the oneness of humanity and you know all of these kinds of ideas. Now what happens with their work when it gets taken up in various venues is a whole different matter, right? And so when you talk about having them understand, they're bringing that understanding to the table often and embedding it into their work, right? In the, in the kinds of ways in which they're framing. So in some ways it's not just a matter of having knowledge of these things and being able to articulate and have conversations, but it's then whether or not they feel accountable to the way their work is used or whether their accountability stops at the lab door. So that's another question about how this circulates in a wider social domain and not simply about the sensibility they bring to their work, which I think you know, is partly a success of humanistic training in a way, right? Uh, let me say this. Um, <clears throat> my first thought was to say, was to think, well, nobody listens to me anyway. And I, but the, um, I think that to the extent that I have experience of this, um, the first thing you have to do is listen to them. Um, you know, uh, allow them, allow the scientists to, to speak. Um, I think one of the mixed blessings of the development of loosely science studies as a, as a coherent enterprise in its own right, and one that's, that's quite theoretically sophisticated, is that um, there's developed a kind of tendency to tell the scientists what they're doing. You know, this is what you're really doing. What you're really doing is building networks or something like that. And I think that can rub them up the wrong way for understandable reasons. Um, so the first thing I think is, is to go in with the, with, the, with the sense that you're going to listen to, to allow them to be your, your informants. Um, the second thing I think is to, is to um, be curious about their everyday practices, the, the struggles that they have to face. Um, you know, I think that there is there's sometimes a sense in the humanistic and social sciences that scientists have it cushy. You know, that, that because they're so much more massively funded than we are, and um, you know, and they have the big labs and the hospitals and things like that, um, whereas we more or less live in caravans, and uh, <laughs> um, uh, and that's really from the point of view of everyday life for scientists, of course, not the reality. The the, the reality is this kind of endless grind of, of grant proposals and getting your postdocs through, and dealing with equipment that doesn't work and all that kind of thing, and I, I think that. Um, a lot of common cause can be made, as it were, by uh, being curious about the, the, the mundane character of the work that they do. But, the, but I, I agree. The other thing is, is of course, to, to be um, uh, appreciative of the, the fact that they see these mundanities as justified in larger terms. I think you're right. You know, they, the, so it's, it's striking how the, there's a certain idealism to it. Um, you know, otherwise they wouldn't keep doing this stuff. Um, and you have to be sympathetic to that, too. Um, uh, and do your homework, that's the other thing. I mean, you can't go, go into a, a lab setting kind of completely uh, ignorant of what the topic is that they're investigating. You have, to have an, you have to have done enough to know, at least at a basic level, you have to have a kind of shared language so that you know when they talk about neurons, what it is that they mean, that kind of thing. Um, I think that it, it builds a barrier very, very fast if, if the person you're talking to thinks that they're wasting their time by talking to you. One quick mm. footnote to mm. what I said, and perhaps mm. it relates also. Mm. Um, I just got an a, a email. They're trying to hire an, a sort of ethics, social science mm. person at the National Human Genome Research Institute. 
Uh, one striking thing about this position is that it requires uh, advanced degree in the life sciences, but not in the social sciences or the ethics. So this is the ethics person. The requirement is that they are trained as a life science, and then if they picked up some sensibilities about ethics and society along the way, that's fine. Despite the fact that one of the key people who is on this count is on the council advocated and advocated to have some parity that there be you know some expectation that there's a PhD in something in the humanities or something, but that they did not were not successful in that. So just pointing again to, to the asymmetry when it gets down to the way that this gets institutionalized, right? Questions? Very hard to beat in a scholarly uh, audience without questions. Uh, <laughs> back there. Uh, I'm uh, Steve Humphreys uh, from the uh, Middle East Studies Association, and this question is for uh, Sarah Jacoby. And um, I'm wondering uh, if you can tell us a bit more how you uh, figured out how to interact uh, with the text, with the autobiography of, of the uh, woman whom you studied. I mean, texts are, you know, sort of very resistant to, uh, to analysis when you haven't grown up in the culture and haven't been a part of it for a long time. And in my experience, at least getting inside them is uh, even something I feel I know well is uh, an awful challenge. So I'm I'm very curious how you were uh, how you went about that task. Um, thank you. That's a great question, and it indeed has been a very long process. I was given a copy of that original manuscript that I showed you a photograph of in 2001. It's now 2013, and I'm wrapping up the book. Um, it's been a long time of encountering this textual material. In short, I would say that my approach has been to combine textual studies with ethnographic studies. Sarah Kondro wrote in the 1930s in a regional dialect of Tibetan that is um, similar to the way people in that region of Golok that I showed you, the shaded area um, of the map, um, similar to the way they still speak today. So. Um, it's not a literary language. It's not something I can find in dictionaries sitting in Chicago. Um, I have to actually talk to people from this region, and I've had to travel there several times in order to figure out even where she's talking about, because she mentions these toponyms that don't exist on Chinese maps anymore. But what you can find if you actually go to these places is that people remember where these places are. So. Um, I read the Sarah, these 620 pages of biographical material, not alone by myself, but with a Kempo, who's a monastic scholar from um, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, who explained to me orally what it meant. And without that kind of intensive, interactive reading, I never could have understood this stuff. Um, and now, even it was written in a kind of uh, cursive Tibetan, uh, paper was scarce in these communities, and so there were a lot of abbreviations. So I literally couldn't even read the text until I had people from that community explain to me how the abbreviations work. So um, I think that you cannot pick up a text like this and understand it. Um, the distance culturally, geographically, temporally is too wide. But there are ways to bridge that distance and I think it's an ongoing process. I'm still reading this stuff and finding myself fascinated by the process of uncovering more about it with each reading. There is a question there. Um, hi, I, I know it's difficult for you to see and I'm, I'm way in the back. Um, I'm Ann Goodyear, I'm the delegate from the College Art Association and thank you all for, for your superb presentations. Um, this is a question for um, Professor Johns um, about the project you're working on, uh, 
presently concerning the intellectual property defense industry, as you put it, which I think is a very intriguing idea. And I wondered if you might be able to say a little bit more about how you relate the impulse towards extraordinary protection of ideas, intellectual property, um, uh, in relation to the impulse towards openness that we're now seeing, and particularly the recent mandate by the White House to open up um, uh, federally funded research. And I'd, I'd just love to hear how you see these two um, different impulses towards protection and openness shaping up against one another right now. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. This is, um, this is one of the most important questions that I think we all face, right? Um, we're, we're dealing here with what will be the, the structure of information creation and circulation for the next generation or so. And, and precisely, you know, it's, it's going to be decided on where the, uh, the, the uh, line is, is constructed between those two missions between, uh, on the one hand, the, the upholding of something like principles of authenticity or authorship on the one hand, and the principle of openness on the other. You know, both of these, and the thing is that the thing that makes it difficult, and the thing that makes it also promising, I think, for, for humanistic kinds of inquiry is that there, there's moral good and evil on both sides. Uh, this is not a case where there are white hats and black hats. Um, what I will say is that in a, in a actually rather surprisingly I think crude sense. The um, this uh, the, the enterprise of of upholding authenticity just doesn't see open access. I mean, it, it's it's interesting when you go to these meetings. They'll they'll talk about all kinds of things, um, but there is unanimity that um, that authorship simply should be protected to the ultimate possible extent. You know, as far as you can push it. And they regard things like the, the turning back of Sopa and Pippa as, as you know, insane, as, as beyond the realm of rationality um, and disastrous. But, they, but, but they, there's no kind of analysis of, of, what, of whether there might need to be changes in the light of that disaster. So the idea is you simply push on again and you know, bring, it, bring it forward the next time, and next time it'll go through, and then they can go to the next stage. Um, the, um, one of the reasons I think why there is this kind of separation is that um, increasingly what's happened with the emergence of, of this industry and the technologies that it uses is a change in the definition of transgression. So it was once the case that things like piracy and counterfeiting were defined in terms of informational violations. Um, so piracy was, was violation of copyright and counterfeiting was violation of trademarks loosely. Um, what's happening in the last five years or so is that the very definition of this is changing for this skilled community of experts. And it's become uh, a definition in terms, straightforwardly, not of information, but of um, transnational networks. So now Interpol's kind of taxonomy of, of transgression is in terms of what, it's, what it calls TIG, uh, trafficking in illicit goods such that anything like counterfeiting and piracy fits in there as a, a category of trafficking alongside the trafficking of humans for sex, you know, sex trafficking or drugs or, or armaments for terrorism. Um, and the informational character of it is actually subordinate to that. And that, that's meant that where perhaps there would have been a kind of, uh, one hopes, I suppose, uh, a kind of necessity for open access and the like to have been thought of in these expert communities, say, 10 years ago. That necessity has retreated because now the, the associations are with um, the, these other kinds of transnational network uh, organizations. Um, so that, you know, that's an, it's an interesting thing that it seems to have moved so far towards that redefinition of the very problem. Um, but uh, you know, what can I say? I agree with you. I think that to say this is to, is to get to some of the foundational issues of how we're all going to live for the next 50 years. Uh, I think we have one more question because we began late. So I think Hi, good morning. My name is Kristen Hodge-Clark. I'm an ACLS public fellow and I'm actually placed with the Association of American Universities as a policy analyst. And so my question gets back to an earlier point that was made about uh, communicating the value of the humanities and social sciences. I mean, that's a big issue that we're tackling right now because 
a lot of our focus is on looking at federally funded research and communicating the benefits, and certainly for those who are familiar with the Coburn Amendment that recently passed that's eliminated uh, political science research from the National Science Foundation. Um, for the panelists, how can I go back to my office and translate your work in a way that is accessible to members of Congress and other politicians and really, again, communicating the value of the humanities and social sciences? <laughs> I just spoke, so I should... Uh, I Please. <laughs> well, uh, should I... I think one... Th I, I think I'd say, say a couple of things about that. One is that, you know, all, all of us here are, are working on topics that, in different ways, press on um, what what culture is going to be, what culture is now. Um, that, so, you know, genomics obviously do, and the understanding of the constitution of selves and things like that through autobiography. I mean, these, these are not, um, to use the example that's always kind of canonical at the University of Chicago, this is not the Assyrian Dictionary. I mean, this is, uh, this is something that um, is, is quite current. I mean, and the other thing I would say is, this is not quite answering your point. Uh, and it may even be kind of counterproductive to your point, but I do think that um, when it comes to insisting upon the importance of what we do for something like policy, a way not to go is to um, kind of sacrifice the essence of what we do for the sake of relevance. Uh, I think what we have that's distinctive is an ability to look at culture deeply as something that is, in my case, historically constituted, in other cases, maybe sociologically or, or uh, anthropologically constituted, but something that is very rich and thick in not quite the, the Gertzian sense, but, but you know, complex and doesn't reduce to simple cost-benefit analysis. Or if, it, if, it, if you can put it in cost-benefit analysis, then the terms of the analysis tend, need to be much richer than they usually are. Um, I think that there's a point when, when you have to put your foot down and insist that there is something you know, valuable and consequential in understanding complexity of cultural circumstances. Um, you know, and, and we have that, you know, we offer that in a way that no other um, kind of organized enterprise does. Um, you know, and when you, when you make policy without an appreciation of the complexities and the unanticipated consequences, then what you get is you know, Iraq. Mm. Mm. I think it rests to thank the panelists.